Good morning, good afternoon all. Um, thank you for joining us today. Um, it's great to see so many of you here. Um, I know a lot of you will be joining us um, post recording, um, so I hope you enjoy, enjoy the webinar. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce today's webinar. Um, we'll be sharing a recording of today's webinar and there'll be an opportunity at the end to ask questions via the chat box. Let me introduce our expert for today, Jessica Werner. Jessica is an expert in creating positive classroom culture as well as SEL and trauma-informed practices. She has worked as a teacher in South America, Africa, Eastern Europe and the United States. She currently teaches classroom management to pre-service teachers through the College of St. Colastic in St. Paul and consults at schools and as an instructional coach and mentor to teachers across the United States. Dr. Werner is also co-authoring a book, Thriving Teachers, Thriving Schools, and is a senior facilitator of the personal leadership program which offers SEL based strategies for leadership. She lives in Minnesota in the USA with her family. Please join me in welcoming and handing over to Jessica. Thank you Jessica. Thank you. Good afternoon everyone um, to those who are here live and those who are joining us at a time that suits you. I totally understand it's one of the nice benefits of the webinar format. Uh, thank you for the introduction. My name is Jessica Werner. I live in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and I am going to be speaking to you all today on how you can support your students and staff during challenging times. Uh, we're living through one right now, obviously. And I'm gonna be talking about the link that exists between social emotional learning, leadership, and resilience. So please let me know. I like to know who I'm talking to. <laughs> so who is here today? Go ahead and put your name, your school, and your position um, in the chat box and your email. And for everybody who comes, I have some goodies to share with you after via email. So if you are viewing this at another time and there is no chat box option, I gave you my email. So if you'll just email me and let me know that you came. Um, I'll meet you virtually that way. So who is here today? Your name, your school, position. Um, like I said, I just always like to know who I'm talking to. And I think it's, I think one of the amazing things with this webinar format that you guys are, are seeing as well is just the fact that we can connect all around the world at once. So that's definitely something none of us are taking for granted right now. So who you are, what school you work at, your position, and your email, if you will, please. And if you're joining us later, um, you can just send that to me. I would appreciate it, thanks. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about myself, <laughs> just so you get an idea of where I'm coming from and why I do what I do. Um, this is a picture of my family. We are, like I said, we're in Minneapolis, Minnesota. I have a third grade daughter and I have a kindergarten age son. My husband works in the US public school system. So he works for our local district. And I consult at schools internationally, nationally here in the States and also internationally. So we have between us, we have quite the education perspective. We see, uh, we have the lens from many, many angles. Um, and we're living through this interesting year of schooling as professionals and as parents. My consulting business is called North Shore Coaching and Consulting. And the whole purpose of what I do is just basically to help teachers thrive, um, to help schools thrive, to help support administrators, and I work, like I said, I work in schools. I have local schools I work in, which has been fun. So I've seen a lot of this pandemic um, life close up. I have schools I work in virtually where I'm doing Zoom currently <laughs> with teachers all over. And I also work at schools internationally. I am a former elementary school teacher. I taught in the US in different regions of the States and in South America, um, in an international school in Eastern Europe. And I spent about 10 years running an international volunteer program in East Africa. So I've spent a lot of time in Kenya and Ethiopia. 
I have been teaching classroom management for the last 10 years at a local college. And really, I think I would love to see the term management change to culture, classroom culture, because that's really a more holistic term for what we do in our schools and in our classes. So how do we create positive cultures that help our teachers to thrive and our students to thrive? And all of the skills I'm going to talk about today can aid in that as well. And then most importantly, uh, my role as a mother. So I'm living through this, like I said, as a professional and as a mother. And my children are in very different school situations. My kindergartner goes to a public school and they are hybrid, which means he goes two days a week, one day on, one day off, every other Friday. It's really complicated. My daughter goes to a private Catholic school, um, and we enrolled her for this year because the private schools around here are open, but my son has a special need, and he can't be serviced in a private school. So it's complicated, and I understand. <laughs> and so I understand it's complicated as parents, it's complicated as administrators, it's all very complicated. So I, I tell you about myself just so you can see where I'm coming from, the, these different lenses. So what we're going to be talking about today is we're going to talk about characteristics, characteristics of SEL, which is social emotional learning and resilience. We're going to identify strategies to help students and staff be resilient. So important right now, important always, super important right now and then discuss implementation for your own context. So I want you to leave with um, a game plan of at least one thing you wanna do that you can implement tomorrow in your context. And I say that because I'm gonna give you so many ideas and I know they don't all work for where you are, who you work with, who you teach. I understand that. Working in lots and lots of schools, I completely understand that. So I want you to take what will work, and apply it. Think of a game plan to apply it. I just want you to take a moment to consider with everything going on, <laughs> I am feeling most grateful for what? Just take a moment. With everything going on, I am feeling most grateful for what? And I know as I speak to you today, um, we have a lot of change happening this week. This is November 3rd. Uh, we have an election. <laughs> We're holding an election today in my country. I know some of your countries in Europe have re-entered some phase of lockdown and I know that's impacting your schools. So a lot of, lot of uncertainty, a lot of turmoil, a lot of things happening. What are you feeling grateful for right now? The reason why I ask, and we'll get to this more as I continue, gratitude is a resilient strategy. So this is a great way to open up a faculty meeting, to open up a call with parents, um, to open up uh, a conference with parents, with students. What am I feeling most grateful for right now? I'm gonna talk more about this, but resilience, gratitude is a resilient strategy. Social emotional learning Around here, we call it SEL. It's still, however, it's fairly new. Um, we've known about SEL for a decade plus. It's been called different things. It's been called character education. It's, it's implemented in different ways. Right now, we really are looking at social emotional learning and that is the way students learn that's not necessarily the intellectual way, okay? So it's not, the memorizing of the math facts or the scores on the test. It's what are the kids learning um, from a standpoint of emotional awareness, EQ instead of IQ. And schools have always been really good at doing this. I think the difference now is they're doing it within this framework and they're doing it intentionally. So the framework I'm using as I talk about SEL is the CASEL framework. And there are five tenets to it. You can tell I'm used to being in person because I'm like using my hands, pretending like I have a screen. Okay. So the five tenets of SEL are self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, 
relationship skills, and responsible decision making. These are all things we, we hope to be able to teach our students from little pre-K, um, early childhood to adult. And as adults, I argue, we're all working on this as well. We are all working on this as well. Um, in the way it's framed is usually around leadership. How do you use these, these five tenets to be a good leader? How do you use these five tenets to increase performance? Because there are, there is data out there that says students who do these five things are, are achieving more. So there's a link between performance and leadership. But today I'm talking about well-being because this is not normal times. And really, and you're all seeing it. You're seeing it in your schools. You're seeing it with your teachers. No matter where you are, no matter who you work with, teachers are fatigued. They are tired. Um, and they're tired even if it feels like the classroom is running smoothly because we all have this cloud of uncertainty on us. When is it going to change? When are we going to go back into lockdown? When is the vaccine going to come? Okay, nobody knows what to expect. So this well-being piece is so critical right now. I think it's really important to acknowledge, guys, that 2020 is not normal. You don't have to call it the new normal. I, I encourage you not to, in fact. Nothing about what's happening right now is normal. We are all doing our best to accommodate, and if anybody's good at changing and accommodating on the fly, it's educators. But what we're living through is not normal, and we shouldn't think about it that way. So these pictures, I have a picture of a kindergarten classroom. I mean, super great idea to make it feel like they're at the beach. <laughs> like, what an amazing kindergarten teacher who came up with this. It'll be just like we're at the beach, just with plexiglass and masks. Um, but they, this is what teachers are doing, just to get by and to, to create good learning environments for their students. And then on the right, you have teenagers who are each sitting at their own desk, separated by plexiglass wearing masks. This is not normal. I mean, there are pieces of this that might follow us after the pandemic, um, but just to keep in mind and to allow yourself the grace to know we just have to get through it. This isn't normal. This isn't what it's gonna be like forever. We just have to get through it. And to remind your teachers of that too. I work in probably a dozen schools right now with teachers who are very fatigued, like I said, and who don't see the light at the end of the tunnel because it, it still seems really far away. So remind them, I understand this is not normal and this is hard and we're gonna get through it. We all just need that reminder. Again, this is not normal and you don't have to get used to it. Nobody has to get used to this. Uh, I tell my children this, and you guys, it's seven months in, almost eight months into this pandemic. For our students, this is a really long time in their lives. My third grader and my kindergartner are convinced it's never gonna end because seven, eight months in the life of an eight-year-old and a five-year-old is a really long time. So to keep that in mind as well, this is really, this experience is really shaping our students. It's really shaping our students as we move through it. This was a quote from the New York Times from a few months ago, and it's still quite relevant. The threats that we feel right now, both real and perceived, act on us like trauma. As a nation, speaking to the US, but this is as an international community, as a social body, we are activated, hypervigilant, anxious, and triggered. We're exhibiting all the symptoms of complex PTSD. Sometimes when I have been presenting, uh, I've been presenting wellness and resilience to teachers for the last three months. I've given many, uh, many workshops virtually and in person. And I always start with this because some we're, we're so used to just working through and, you know, we keep going. It's like we're on a bike and we keep riding the bike that we, we don't stop to think about how it's affecting us because we're just doing our jobs day after day after day. And once we sit back and we realize, oh my gosh, the way our bodies are interpreting what's going on and the way our brains are seeing this, this is trauma. 
this is traumatic. We need to give ourselves more grace to walk through it. So again, this is trauma. This is a collective worldwide trauma we're all experiencing. Our brains are in flight or fight mode. I talk about this a lot more in depth. I really jump into the neuroscience when I present to schools because there is a lot of physiological evidence that our brains adapt to trauma. And when they do that, it makes it hard for us to learn. And it makes us, it hard for us to concentrate. Like for example, <laughs> today is kind of a stressful day in my country. Um, I found it hard to concentrate, okay? And that, that's the effect of trauma on the brain. All of us are stuck, whether or not we know it or realize it, in a fight or flight response, and we're activated. We're hyper aware, we're hyper vigilant, like the quote said. And that's gonna last until COVID's over, which unfortunately, we don't know the end. And then we're gonna see these residual effects after. This is not gonna end when the vaccine comes out um, and we can take off our masks. You're gonna see these residual effects of trauma in your students and in your faculty. I like this picture of trauma because it shows you on the right is a, a normal brain and on the left is a brain impacted by trauma and it just it makes everything harder to do. So for those of you, if anybody's having trouble sleeping or if you have different eating habits than you did back in February, um, if you're feeling lethargic, places in your body that aren't normally tight or tense are bothering you. These are different ways trauma is impacting you physiologically. And you're gonna see it in your students as well. I'm in a lot of schools where students are having a lot of stomach aches and headaches. A lot of stomach aches and headaches. So if that's something you've seen as well, it could be a side effect of trauma. So when we were all in teacher school, <laughs> we were taught to teach to the top of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. We are supposed to be teaching to self-actualization and esteem, but right now, during this time, during this pandemic, everybody needs permission to be at the bottom because we don't feel safe. We may be healthy or we may be unwell, um, but we physiologically, we're not feeling that we're in a normal state right now. Because if you aren't sick, you're probably worried about getting sick. And if it's, you're not personally affected by COVID, it's likely you know somebody who is. So the safety and physiological need is the number one need we all have right now, your students and your staff and yourself. So what do we do? <laughs> how, do we, how do we move forward? How do we get to the other side? I really, I, I have to be intentional because I have bad days. I have bad dark days where I get really upset. I get upset about the fact that my kindergartner doesn't have a real kindergarten experience. I get upset about the fact that there are millions of kids who haven't been in a school in seven months. I get upset. So I'm really personally trying to be intentional about seeing this time as an opportunity to build resilience. And building resilience is a buffer to trauma. The more resilient you can be, it minimizes the impact of trauma. Resilience is bouncing back. It's our way of getting through. It's our way of moving through a tough time. And it helps us be able to minimize the impact of trauma. This is really, really important. Because when we hear about trauma, we feel overwhelmed. Oh my gosh, our students are living through this. What can we do? This is one thing we can do, and I'm gonna tell you about some strategies to do it. Before I get started, um, I wanna tell you this little story I read. I was really into reading this summer. I read a lot of books about people who had been through hard times, um, you know, because here we are, we're living through a hard time. So I wanted to hear stories of success and resilience and, and people who did hard things. And locally, in our local paper, they interviewed a man named David Wheat, and he had been a prisoner of war in Vietnam for seven years. So he was a POW for seven years, and they interviewed him, and they said, first of all, how did you, how did you get through that? Um, 
because at the time we're in like month three of COVID and how'd you get through seven years and what advice do you have? And I thought, I just, I felt like what he said was really timely and moving. He said, the first thing was that I focused on what I could control. I focused on what I could control. And those are some of the strategies I'm gonna share with you next. I didn't think of all the things I couldn't control. I focused on what I could control. And for him, it was keeping his cell clean. Okay, so he said, every day I cleaned my cell. And he said, I focused on my thoughts and I focused on what I was thinking about and I had to be really intentional to focus on gratitude. And so he said, every night I would sit up in my cell and I would count my blessings. I'm grateful to be alive. I'm grateful to have a neighbor to talk to. I'm grateful I was fed today. And so I just found the story really powerful. The image I share is of a lotus growing in the mud. Um, so there's a Buddhist saying, no mud, no lotus. Okay, and the lotus is how we, is what happens after. What comes out of this mud? How are we stronger? How do we cultivate the ability to be stronger than we were when it started? No mud, no lotus. This is a picture, these are my children. This is last year and on their first day of school, it was gonna be a totally normal year, just like every other year, second grade and pre-K. And I have watched over the last seven months um, as my children have reacted to COVID in really different ways. And, and I've seen, I've seen what it looks like outwardly when they express, I'm sad, I don't like this, I'm worried. And I've seen the effects on the child who doesn't express it outwardly, which is my son. A um, lot of violent tantrums that we've been having over the last couple of months. My daughter can tell you, today I'm feeling really disappointed because I don't get to see my friends because we're in quarantine. Like she's very social emotionally aware. My son has a tantrum and throws things. And then he curls up in a corner later and says, mommy, when is COVID going to end? Okay. And you're seeing the spectrum of emotion and of this dealing with the trauma at your schools as well. Just because you have students who aren't showing outwardly that they're upset or they're worried or they're affected doesn't mean that they aren't. And this is the same for your faculty. This is the same for your faculty. Okay. So part of resilience is just giving people space to handle it however they're handling it and to acknowledge that just because you don't see it it doesn't mean it's not there i work with so many principals who they they told me back in like mid-september oh my gosh it's going great you know the kids are back and my teachers are great and i thought oh my gosh that's amazing yay and then i would walk into schools and i would see teachers crying in the hallway, I was pulled aside by a teacher in one school who said, I'm gonna retire, even though I'm 10 years away from retirement. And I thought, there's so much beneath the surface that people aren't seeing. So just to acknowledge that that might be there. Here's a great book I recommend. Um, I read it back in like April. And it talks about the resources resilient people have. Now it lists 12 resources that are characteristics of resilient people. But in the spirit of only putting on your plate things you can actually control, I've only <laughs> included the four that you would have control over as a school leader. Some of them are like student socioeconomic status. Okay, that's not something you can control. But these are things you can control, and I'm gonna share some ways you can do that. These are ways you can help foster resilience in your staff and in your students. And they are providing structure, providing support, focusing on positivity, and on building relationships. And I'm going to talk about each one now. And again, yeah, take a screenshot. This was a great book. It was exactly what I needed to read. Um, but I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you the, the takeaways. So if you have worked with me, you know my number one focus is always on relationships, always. Because whatever we need to be doing needs to start with relationships. I 100% believe that and I've seen that play out time and time again. So
So no matter what's happening in your school, if you are distance, if you are hybrid, if you are in person, if you are high flex, which is where your teachers have students in front of them and they have students zooming in, everybody needs to have this focus on relationships and community. Providing structure. Kids of all ages want to know what to expect. Their world right now is being rocked. You know, it, a lot of us, things we had relied on that, that gave us structure to our days and to our lives are gone. Something like going to the gym. Some of you are in countries where you can't go for a walk outside right now. Those things are gone. But what we can do in our classrooms is provide structure and support and consistency. And when I say consistency, I'm not saying to teach the same way or the same thing every day. But it's important for students to know what happens throughout the day. It's important for students to know what behaviors you will encourage and accept. Okay, this is part of consistency. And love. I don't know anybody who became a teacher who doesn't at their core love students. And I have actually, I've talked to many administrators who are, who are convinced otherwise. Um, but I haven't worked with a teacher who at their, at their core doesn't love students. And to be honest, there are a lot easier ways to make money. So there are easier things to be doing right now with our time. We're here because we love, we love the kids. We want the kids to succeed. And I think it's really important to hold that closely and to remember it during this hard time. Structure, consistency, love. That is what the students need most from their teachers right now. And that is what your teachers need most from you. If you have teachers doing distance learning, if you have students at home, or even if they're doing the high flex both at once, the most critical part of their whole day are the days when they're live with their students, 100%. If your teachers are not doing this, they're missing a huge opportunity. This time allows students to talk, socialize, and build community. And those are the things they're missing. Those are the things they're missing. So making sure if your school does eat, if it does distance or hybrid or high flex, make sure your teachers are going live with their students. If it seems overwhelming and they're not sure how to fit it into their day, send me an email. I work with two schools of teachers who are doing high flex and they are amazing at including their distance learners and their on-campus learners at the same time. Um, and what we work on now is how do you allow the students to build community with what they've got? This is what they need. This is what they need. Here's a picture of my um, kindergartner as a preschooler trying to engage in online learning. It did not go very well. <laughs> um, but the one time my son would tune in is the once a week live session his teacher did where all the students in his class got on and they did like a scavenger hunt or they did, they did a sharing. That's the only time he would engage. It meant so much to him. All the asynchronous learning, it was just off the table. So really, really making sure you're including this live component. And that goes the same for when you're communicating with families and with your staff. I know you can always record something and put it on YouTube, send it out, but the live piece is so important for community building. And it reminds families that they're connected to the school. Because right now there's a lot of disconnection if they're distance or if their kids are like in and out. I mean, there's just, they're probably hearing less from teachers because the poor teachers are super busy. As parents, this is critical for us to help us feel connected. If you can, and this is on a personal level and on a school level, structure nature, fresh air and movement into your day and into your students' day. Um, this can look lots of different ways and it can be tough. I mean, it can, there's, there's a lot involved in getting kids outside. And I know some of you have schools where that's just not an option. Maybe you're in the middle of the city. Um, this, these pictures are from the middle of the city in St. Paul. 
And last year I was working at a school, it's the German immersion school. Oh my gosh, sorry. Uh, the German immersion school in St. Paul, and they did not have a gym. So the gym was being renovated and the poor gym teachers had to do um, gym all, all year outside. So in some of the places you live, this wouldn't be a big deal, but in Minnesota, we have a six month long winter. It is freezing cold. Gym outside was a big ask. And I took these pictures as I went to observe, I think this was like a first grade class, um, just how much the children enjoyed it. There is something about nature and fresh air. It increases our serotonin. It improves our resilience getting up and moving, doing it outside ideally. These are little things you can incorporate or you can have your teachers incorporate to do like a really quick increase of serotonin during their day. And because I wanna practice what I preach, I am gonna go for a bike ride after this <laughs> presentation. Sorry, let me click off. Um, and it's interesting because our our default when we're in trauma and when we're stressed is to be inside and to go inward and to like close your office door and sit in solitude or curl up on the couch with Nutella. That's what I do. Uh, but actually the best thing for you is to get outside. Same for your students, get outside. This is a faculty meeting <laughs> that was hosted outside. I was, um, I was giving a talk on resilience for the teachers and again I thought well <laughs> if you can do this meeting outside you can do a lot of things outside um, they brought their own blankets they brought their own chairs we were socially distanced there are ways to make it work there are ways to make it work and I've seen some really creative ways to make it work recently again if you're like I don't know how to make this work but I'm curious send me an email we can talk it through Super important right now to be checking in with your students. Doing SEL check-ins to allow them to process their feelings that will promote self-awareness. They are having lots and lots of feelings right now. I promise you that. Like I said, even if you can't see it, it is happening. The same goes for your faculty. Checking in with people to allow them to process. And here are a few ways you can do that. This is a color-coded feeling check-in, SEL check-in that a middle school teacher I work with does. And she has her middle school students come in, grab a piece of paper where the emotion corresponds to how they're feeling at that, in that moment, because as people have told me many times, middle school emotions change all the time. Absolutely. So this is in that moment. And then she has them drop it in a basket. And then she can look at the basket and know right away she can take the temperature of her class, which is not a metaphor I love right now. But she can see, okay, we have a lot of happy kids. There's a lot of yellow. Oh, there's a lot of blue. We have a lot of sad, depressed kids today. And it's brilliant. And she doesn't have to ask them any questions outright, but she can just look at her basket and know what they're walking in with. This teacher, she's pretty amazing. She actually takes it a step further. And then when she has a full basket, she creates a collage. And she has one whole wall of her classroom that are these collages of these colors. And I asked her, I said, why, why do you do that? Is it like a decoration technique? And she said, yes. And it also normalizes feelings for my students. If they're having a blue day, they can look up at the wall and see, all right, I'm not the only one who's ever felt sad or depressed. It normalizes feelings. I can see this being used in faculty meetings. Grab a piece of paper. How are you feeling today? Maybe you don't even talk about it. Maybe you just hold up your piece of paper. I love this. Because for some of us, and definitely my five-year-old would be one of these kids, he has a hard time naming emotions. But if you, if you correspond it with a color, it's a lot easier for him. And adults feel the same way. This is called an Alive Check-In. Um, it is from a trauma-informed schools program. And I do a lot of work in trauma-informed schools. Miss Kendra is the name of the program. And this was done in my daughter's second grade class. And again, it's a, it's a check-in. And it has 
colors corresponding to how many worries you're feeling today. Because at the bottom you see worries make it hard to learn. And so every day her second grade class, they would walk in, they would have a list of things to do and they would put their clippy wherever they were on the board. And again, it gave their teacher a really quick and easy way to take the temperature of the class, take the temperature of the class. Um, and when they were on blue, he would check in. He would check in. I've also seen this done as a worry basket where it's not as public, but you can drop your worries into the basket. I actually encouraged a lot of the principals I worked with before school started because they were getting inundated with the parent phone calls and emails and what's it gonna look like and what, what, what? And really it was, it was parents scared to death of the uncertainty and not knowing. And I said, you should put a worry basket in your office <laughs> so they could drop it in. Because a lot of times we just need to be heard, right? We just need to be heard. And allowing people the space to be heard is sometimes all they need. This is a great, super simple activity I learned about last week. Um, I went to a trauma-informed school symposium. I'm gonna share that information with you. Giving the writing prompt to students, or you know what, giving the writing prompt to your faculty, during this pandemic, I wish my teacher knew. During this pandemic, I wish my headmaster knew. And then seeing what they tell you. And the example they gave at the symposium was of a child who had a lot of behavior problems um, and he was really quiet. So they, nobody ever felt like they knew him very well. They didn't feel like they knew how to connect with him. And he wrote, during this pandemic, I wish my teacher knew my dad is in jail and we don't have internet at home. Two huge, huge things causing trauma and impacting his social emotional learning. And the teacher said, I had no idea. Okay. You might not get answers that are as profound or as big as that, but it might give you just a little more insight into what's happening. And you never know, you never know what people are going to share. I also, I've been encouraging some of the teachers I work with um, to do this, but as a, an art activity. During this pandemic, I wish my teacher knew, and then the kids draw it. Art is great for resilience. <laughs> it's a great resilience building strategy. It's great for trauma, um, to help kids work through trauma. Or do it with your, do it with adults. What do you wish your, or what do you wish you know, as a parent, there are things I would love that I would love to be asked from our school principals. What do you wish I knew about your family or your situation? So, yeah, just giving people the opportunity to tell you what's going on. And you could take away some very valuable information to help meet kids or your faculty where they're at. And again, a resilience practice is focusing on gratitude. This is the deal with our brains. And like I said, when I give these talks to teachers, I actually, I spend a lot of time talking about um, the way our brains are set up. Our brains are inclined to focus on negative things. And you'll see it if you, and I see it all the time when I work with teachers on classroom culture and classroom behavior their attention and their focus goes to the kid or the kids who aren't doing what they need to be doing. And sometimes they have like 25 other kids in front of them who are doing exactly what they need to be doing, but the teacher's focus is on what's wrong. And I help teachers work through really doing a mindset shift on, into what is going well. And this mindset shift is so critical right now because if we think too hard, which a lot of us do, I am guilty, there's a lot that's not okay right now. There's a lot that's not okay. I mean, in my country, whew, we've got COVID numbers, we've got um, a lot of political strife, we have injustice in communities, people of color. There's a lot not going well. And it can be overwhelming. And in fact, even if I, as I said, those three things, I could feel the muscles in my back tensing up. Okay, so making an intentional practice of focusing on gratitude. There are ways you can do it at school. Again, start out your faculty meetings. Like, 
let's go around. What's one thing you're grateful for that happened today? Or what was the high of your day? Everybody go around and tell me the high of your day. It can be part of your daily announcements. Um, I see this done in classes a lot right now, which is awesome. Everybody go around, like, what's one thing you're thankful for? Americans do it a lot around Thanksgiving time in November, but I really want to push doing it all the time because there is, there's always something to be grateful for. Make it a part of school culture. Make this gratitude piece a part of school culture. We are focusing on gratitude. We are focusing on positive. Here are ways you can do it for yourself because all these things are good ideas for other people, but everything starts here. You have to be the model. You have to be the model of gratitude and of resilience and of a focus on social emotional learning. You have to model it. Administrators model it for the teachers and the teachers model it for the students. So ways you can do this personally, start a gratitude journal. Um, I actually started one on the computer just because it was easier. And every day I type in three things I'm grateful for. Boom, boom, boom. I also, everywhere I go, I carry a notebook. Sometimes I just jot, focus on gratitude. And I make myself do this when I'm falling into a place of like uncertainty and overwhelm. Focus on the wins. That's why the very first question I asked you guys when we started this webinar was, what is going well? What are you most grateful for? Focus on the wins, okay? These are ways you can do this personally and at school. Also an important aspect of resilience is incorporating and encourage voice. We've talked about this a little bit. Letting people talk. Knowing that it's okay to share how they're feeling. I work with a lot of teachers who are afraid to let their administrators know that they're not okay right now because the school culture is pushing just keep going, just keep going. And they're doing that. And it's really hard. So holding that as an and, we, we're gonna keep going. My teachers are doing amazing. And they're also really struggling. Showing your teachers you understand that. Um, encouraging faculty voice, encouraging student voice. This is a picture from a middle school here in the States where at the very beginning of the school year, so back in September, uh, that was our school year beginning, they had the students go through and create this chart of things they want to feel at school. Um, red is things they want to feel more. Blue are things they want to feel less. C here, etc. So they asked the students, what do you want to feel more of at school? What do you want to see more of? I want to see more friendship. I want to see more high fives. Okay. Ways that you incorporate student voice and faculty voice. It allows agency because right now we don't feel like we have a lot of agency. We don't feel like we have a lot of control. So giving people the opportunity to exercise agency and control right now is very, very important. This is a little bit just about the work I've been doing for the last couple of months. I've been leading workshops where I, I call them different things and they, they're different in all the schools, but essentially it's encouraging teachers to put on your oxygen mask first. You know, like when you're on the airplane and they're like, in case of a water landing, you put on your oxygen mask before assisting others. Teachers and administrators, this is so critical. This is so critical. So encouraging your teachers to do this, but also providing opportunities for them to do it themselves. Um, for example, I'm giving a workshop next week, next Tuesday, a week from today, to about 12 schools. And it's a teacher PED day. We're going to do this virtual workshop, and it's on resilience. And the teachers <laughs> would much rather have a day off. They would much rather have a day off. But this has been planned by the leadership specifically to make them think about themselves for two hours. So what we talk about for two hours is all about you. What do you need to do to take care of yourself during this time? And what does it look like? And these are some of the answers I got from this same version of the workshop I gave a few weeks ago. These are the answers the teachers told me at the end when I said, what are you taking away from this workshop? They said, peace, grace, positivity, clarity, 
these are really powerful words. And this was not how they were feeling when they went into the workshop. They were like, why isn't this a day off? And then they walked away with these feelings. It matters. Giving people voice and opportunity to process and focus on themselves, it really, really matters for morale. Here is a final recommendation. I mentioned it earlier. There, there was a symposium on trauma-informed schools, trauma-sensitive schools. And it was ASCD, they're a big professional development group in the United States. And they brought together all kinds of experts on trauma, trauma and resilience. And it was a one day um, symposium. Well, I couldn't attend <laughs> because I was working, I was in a school all day. Um, but I have been watching these uh, breakout sessions like an hour here, half an hour there when I have time, and they are fabulous. And so if you are interested in just more, I know a lot of us are zoomed out um, and I totally get it, but if, if you wanna know more and you wanna hear from other people, this is a great way to do it. I'm just gonna go ahead and recommend my favorite one I listened to, I listened to it twice. It was Dr. Melissa Sadin, and it was the intersection of cult cultural competence and trauma-informed schools. I believe this link should work for you to be able to register, but sometimes links don't work on Zoom. So if not, you can just Google ASCD and you can sign up anytime between now and December 27th. Yeah, this was really, this was really worth the time. Um, and like I said, I just went ahead and recommended my favorite breakout to you <laughs> in case, because it's kind of overwhelming. You know, when you go to a conference, you're like, I wanna see everything. This is a great place to start. And then here's another quick check-in for SEL, for self-awareness. I want you to think about on the one to nine scale of rubber ducks, where are you right now? Are you a one? Are you feeling good? Are you a nine? It was a very long Tuesday. Are you feeling pulled in two directions like the number five? This is another great way to get people thinking and feeling without necessarily naming emotions. I use this all the time in my trainings. People giggle and chuckle, um, but I find even for adults, sometimes it's hard to put your, your word on the feeling or put your finger on the feeling that you can really identify with duck number seven. Okay, so just finding ways, encouraging voice, encouraging engagement, encouraging talk, all of this fosters resilience. All of this is going to make what is on the other side better. And now is the time to do it. Okay, and this is for you to think about. Of all the things I talked about, and of course, this will be available for people to watch um, whenever. All the things I talked about, I want you to think of one you want to focus on today. What's something you're like, oh, I can do that. Think about which piece feels like something you can control. Oh, at the next faculty meeting, I can start by asking everybody to tell me the high of their day. Boom. Oh, I can talk to my teachers about whether or not they're doing check-ins with students. I can ask the next parent who calls me, how are you doing? Is there anything I should know? Um, about your distance learning situation, you know? What is your action step for today? What is something you can walk away and do? What feels within your control? And here is my information, jessica at northshorecc.org. I would love to hear from you. Um, for me, like I said, I'm a relationship person. I like the webinar format because it allows me to be able to interact with so many of you around the world, but I, I, it's not the same. It's not the same as being in person and seeing your faces and know how, what you find useful from the webinar, what you'd like more of. So please feel free, say hello. This is my website, northshorecc.org. I am available for troubleshooting. If you want to talk about ways to increase resilience in your staff, if if you have a specific instance of something or a child or whatever, feel free to reach out. This is why, this is why I'm here. 
and just thank you. Thank you for the amazing and hard work you're doing. This is a super difficult time to be doing it. Yesterday, I was working with a teacher who is in her 40th year of teaching. She's just like, it has never been this hard. And it's hard on teachers, but I know, I know how hard it is on you all as administrators as well. I know you didn't get a break this summer. Um, things are changing constantly. So thank you. Thank you for your service. Thank you for your work. Uh, keep doing what you're doing. And yes, I'd love to hear from any of you. Uh, let me know what you think. Thank you. Right, thank you. Thank you so much for your time, Jessica. You shared some amazing resilient practices. Um, one that stood out for me was the piece of the paper. How how simple um, is that technique? I know a lot of people should hopefully take that back into their schools. Um, another thing you touched on was the outdoor learning. Um, we actually had a fantastic webinar a few weeks back from um, Marty and Tracy about outdoor learning restoration. Um, so for anyone who would like more information about that, I will pop it in the post um, webinar email so you can, can visit that one. Um, along with any other um, previous webinars that you might have had, which might touch on um, some of Jessica's um, techniques as well um, as reaching out to Jessica. I'm sure she'd love to hear, hear from you all. Um, I know I will be definitely reading the book you recommended, Change the World. Um, that's on my, on my list um, of books to read. Um, so thank you so much, Jessica. I know so many people will be watching this um, on demand and we'll be pushing it out far and wide and um, so please share it with your colleagues if you've enjoyed today's webinar um, yeah and thank you so much once again Jessica um, and we hope to see you soon hopefully at our leadership conference um, great thank you Jessica thank you for your time today thank you bye all <laughs>